It's time to, uh, to hear from some of the people that are out uh, working the lands and experiencing the, the climate change and what we're talking about today. Um, so with us we have four panelists uh, who we will each come up and they'll, they'll speak a little bit about their operation, background, the conditions that they face in, in their operation. Uh, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. So to start us off, and by the way, I'm Mark Gustafson. I'm the interim director of the Rural Futures Institute here. I also am a fifth generation farmer, farming about 45 miles north of here near Mead, Nebraska. It's a dry land corn and soybean operation, which I try to do in the evenings and on weekends, um, as well as this. So our first uh, uh, producer that's going to speak today is Antonio Fajera, Fajeda, excuse me, uh, who has recently returned to his family's ranches in uh, Mato Grosso do Sol in Brazil. Uh, prior to that, he was a uh, he spent uh, a number of years in international uh, supply chain management with a large company down there. Uh, but um, as he told us earlier. The family ran out of uncles to run the, the ranch, so it was his turn, and he decided to come back, and, and he's enjoying it. So with that, Antonio. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been a real pleasure being here. I'm very happy with this invitation. Uh, we were requested to share a view of the field, and uh, I'll try to focus a, a little bit in my operation, but also a little bit in the Brazilian in terms of uh, water. So yes, uh, my background is in freight forwarding and global logistics. I've been I took over the ranch two and a half years ago, but uh, even though uh, it's been a f few years doing that, uh, our family has been in Brazil for 290 years uh, being ranchers. Uh, when they first came, they were in the search of uh, gold and emeralds, and they were given a land by the emperor at that time for that. But uh, ever since uh, from my grand grandfather, we have been uh, ranching cattle. Uh, I'm also a member of the, the board of the Novillo Precoce Association, which is an association focused on uh, precocious cattle and high quality beef that specifically supplied the Brazilian market with quality beef. Uh, the major importers for the Brazilian beef is actually Russia and Iran, which are not the most quality demanding beef. So. The association is focusing on supplying the Brazilian market, and last year uh, we sold over 138,000 animals, and the expectations for this year is 150,000. It's not only about just producing high-quality beef, but how are we producing it? So we uh, have a G, uh, BPA, which is like the Brazilian gap for those who are familiarized with the uh, good agriculture practice. This one is more focused in the bovine and cattle operations, and we are backed up by three of our uh, ministries, the agriculture, labor and work, and uh, environment. So it's about uh, safe food, uh, animal welfare. So in order to become a member of the association, you must obey and go by these rules to get the... And why are we participating in the association? Because the major uh, protein buyer uh, of the world, JBS, came to an agreement with us that if we did meet these requirements, we would be rewarded with a bonus. So, uh, to say a little bit about water in Brazil, uh, very briefly, but uh, this is two of the major uh, aquifers that we have. One of them is called the Alter de Chão, the north part of Brazil, and the other one is the Guarani, which we share with three other countries in Latin America. And uh, just to illustrate, this is 
of course, the, the longest river we have, but we do have several rivers. We're f very fortunate with water availability. And uh, we're, uh, the Amazon River is 60 times larger in volume water than the second longest river in the world. I was actually participating in the, the presentations yesterday, and I was just thinking that when I was going to put those slides up, you're just going to think that we're spoiled in water. Uh, regarding the Brazilian agribusiness, uh, we're supposed to, to be one of the, the biggest, better, and, and cheapest production in the world. I don't know how long we're going to keep up with being the cheapest. Uh, we're being very pressured for uh, sugarcane plants, especially as they build their plants close to the city, and a lot of people are migrating from living in the farm to living in the city and increasing uh, manpower costs, especially. But uh, yeah, we're, we're still over there. Uh, our production area covers just about 30% of our total land, uh, which leaves 61% uh, uh, of our land remains untouched. So if we will look in the, uh, in the chart over there, we will see that 11% of our land is taken for uh, infrastructure in city. Uh, we have 50% of preserved areas still, and 11% of preserved areas inside our farms and, and ranches. So it's a total of 61% of preserved area. Um, with the available technology that, that we have nowadays, uh, we were supposed to, we have the capability of increasing virtually our production area in 170 million acres. And if we would translate that into beef production, it would be just about doubling our capability and in, in grains, triple it. I'll get back into irrigation later on. Um, okay, I'd just like to... Uh, place a few uh, pictures over there and talk a little bit about what happened in Brazil last year in terms of uh, a bill that was passed uh, regarding natural resources utilization. And uh, one of the main difficulties that uh, especially cattle ranchers face was how are we, how, how are our cattle going to have access to water? Because the after the bill was passed, the restriction that we're now facing, the cattle was almost forbidden to drink it out of the river. So how are we going to manage that? So depending on the width of the river that you have going through your land, if you, if you do have it, uh, you're supposed to have from a, a 20 to a 100 yards uh, native forestry planted over that margin. So who, who's paying for all that? We are. <laughs> uh, Another thing I would like to share about this bill that was passed uh, uh, is regarding the forestry reservation. That depends on which state you're located in Brazil. You must leave from 20 to 80 percent of your property to reservations, to reserved areas of native forestry. So, if you're in debt with your with your uh, reserved area, you cannot just go ahead and plant some pine trees that will grow in, in a heartbeat. You have to, to go with the, with the native. And uh, this is being watched very closely. So my state is 20%. In the Amazon, for instance, it's 80%. So uh, what I'm just trying to say here is that, uh, yes, we are being watched very closely, a, a lot of finger pointing to, to us. We're doing our homework. I, I just wanted to share a few pictures of worldwide rivers, but also a uh, river in the Brazilian urban areas that are just not going by the same rules that, that we are. Uh, excess of water. I hope I got that spelled right. Uh, Pantanal uh, region is in the backyard of my, our property, just about a three-hour drive. And uh, this is what happened in February 2011. It just rained so hard in such a short time that if the farmer was lucky enough to get his cattle to a dry land, that was good. But there were some farmers that were not lucky enough 
and just got caught up. We have excess of water, we have lack of water. It's not only a Nebraska issue. This is in the northeast part of Brazil, and this is yesterday's news from the paper. An estimated 1.8 billion losses due to this dry season of last year. Five million cattle heads died due to this issue. Okay, now about my personal operation a little bit. I'm running uh, two ranches. It's uh, cow and, one is a cow and calf operation, and uh, the other one is where I send the animals when they reach eight months of age. So uh, I have a few few numbers over there. It's, it's for Brazilian standards. It's not it's not a large operation. Uh, just about two thousand heads, forty two hundred acres. Uh, it is, it is the entire uh, change. We, uh, we don't sell any calves. We only sell them to uh, beef industry. The, the heifers with uh, average 26 months of age and the uh, steers 32 months of age. And this brings me to uh, the, the second thing I would like to point out is that we were uh, majorly working with the Nelore breed of cattle, which is a zebu uh, breed which is highly adapted to the tropicals. And uh, we were, I would say a decade or, or more for now, using more and more uh, mixture breeds. And uh, I'm just uh, an Angus fan, and we have been using that ever since. So this picture in the middle is what our production looks like nowadays. Uh, we have the Nelora cows with the crossed uh, calves, and uh, we get the tropical adaptation from one breed, and the high productivity carcass of, of the Angus. Um, I think my logistics background just helped me tremendously in uh, how to improve uh, our business with all the data collection and uh, the performance indicators, making me a better buyer when I went out uh, to go for, for uh, products. and. Uh, the training that uh, we do every three to four months to to our team to keep them motivated, I think that made a, a big change. These uh, trainings are also provided by the BPA I mentioned uh, earlier on, so we, we get support for that. Uh, the picture on the left is just uh, us uh, testing the fertility of our uh, bulls. So. Maybe for some of you guys this is not uh, news, but uh, when I took over the ranch, none of this <laughs> were there, so it was quite quite challenging and quite rewarding when you see that you're reducing the the, the selling time of your product. Uh, so. Uh, with the, with the mixed cross, uh, we're expecting to reduce the, the selling age in just about 11 months. My fixed cost for, per head is $15 per head. So if I'm able to do that in uh, 500 animals that we average uh, sell for the, for the year, that's just about a, an increase of gross profit of 82 uh, thousand, but of course there are the costs for the inseminations, uh, everything that comes along with it. But uh, I'm a very high tech fan, so just like to point that out. Uh, okay, this is where we get spoiled, I think. That's the average of rain that uh, we have in one of our ranches. Uh, this uh, reservoir is um, filled from a well. That gives me a 15-day buffer of, of water for my cattle, and it gets distributed to, to five food courts. Uh, we also are uh, using the, the swales and contour farming to uh, better usage of uh, rainwater. And uh, this is from 2008 when we did plant some soybeans, which we're not doing at this very moment. Uh, it was a non-irrigated uh, agriculture. Uh, 
Why are we not using more irrigate, irrigation in, in Brazil? There is uh, said to be 30 uh, million th 30 million acres of land that is irrigable in Brazil, and only five is being used. Why is that? The law that was passed last year just made it almost impossible for you to get a license to use river water or any kind of uh, natural resources water, so nobody's engaged in that. Plus, the electricity bill is just a joke. So if you have an average X dollars uh, monthly electricity bill, and next month uh, it rains quite f well in your farm, and you don't have to use it that much, use it one day of the month, they will charge you for the electricity that they, they made available to you. And they will charge you based on the average electricity bill that you have. So who's up for that? Okay, the, the other farm is more of a, a hilly area. Uh, again, fortunate enough, enough to have a natural spring and a water mine that feeds the, the food courts by, based on uh, gravity. But uh, I cannot distribute all the water that well. So uh, as the dry season is not severe in Brazil, I'm able to make uh, ponds and those, the, this water will last uh, throughout the the winter. It is 100% grass fed, yes. Um, and you can see the difference in the carcass here. But I, I, I'd just like to, to point out because I was uh, approached and say, okay, oh, oh, this is wonderful, you guys are doing uh, grass fed. And I said, yes, we're doing it. But I'm not for a minute be a hypocrite here and say that. Uh, the job you guys are doing is not right. Because if, if, if we had the market for that, we would probably be more engaged in doing it. It's just a market issue. So if our biggest buyers are Russian and Iran, and this is how it is going, this is how we're producing. The, the food conversion of, of, of an animal to go from 1,200 pounds to 1,500 pounds is just extremely pricey. So the bonus that we have with JBS nowadays just won't pay for it, so this is our cutoff weight. Uh, a little bit about uh, history here, uh, how things change a little bit. Uh, this is Rio Grande, close to uh, where my great-grandfather used to have a, a ranch. And uh, when his cattle was ready to be sold, he had to travel 220 uh, miles on foot to another ranch and swim across this river. They would rest there for 30 days, recover from this, this journey, and then they would travel again on foot to the beef industry. And then it would get freighted from there to, to the urban areas. Again, we'd, we improved in, in terms of cattle, but in terms of railroad, we just went down the road. So, I mean, I just try to come up with something. I mean, how did we improve in terms of water usage in our farm? I don't know if this does make much sense, but uh, I try my best. So if the, the cattle uh, average consumption in water is just about 90% of its weight, and from my great-grandfather operation to our operation, we reduced that in 37 months, someone could suggest that they're drinking 360 less barrels of water during their lifetime. On the other hand, also, okay, we, we do improve the amount of cattle that we're growing, so. But uh, I think this. So yes, uh, I was invited here to give a view from the field, and I think this is my favorite view from the field. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. Thank you. It's always interesting to hear, hear how people are looking at their operations and the, the issues that they face, and, and we each in our own environments face not only the, the uh, climatic changes, but bureaucracies that are somewhat different as well. So um, our next uh, producer is Michael Kelly. Mike, Mike is a third generation cow-calf uh, rancher and uh, uh, banker uh, uh, business, which probably works out really well. Um, in, 
out near Sutherland, Nebraska. He was telling us earlier that uh, his, uh, his family originally came and settled in what is now uh, underwater in the, uh, in the um, yeah, Lake McConaughey, I'm sorry. So uh, they moved their operations some, and we'll hear from uh, Mike now. Mark, how do I start this? Oh, there we go. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, I was telling Antonio there earlier is if we're going to gauge the uh, quality of the, of the Spock speech by how far they came, then Antonio from Brazil is certainly our expert here today. But uh, anyway, uh, my name again is Mike Kelly. I was, uh, have been, uh, grew up in west central Nebraska at Sutherland. I now live in North Platte, and, and I have a uh, we have a family operation. I have a son on the ranch, and I have a, a younger son here, Tom, today, that's a, a senior at the University of Nebraska, majoring in ag econ. And uh, so our operation has been a, a family operation, going back to uh, my grandfather came over from Ireland in uh, 1885. He was the youngest of three brothers. Uh, at that time, they only had room for, for one son on the, on the ranch, and the eldest son get to, or on the farm back there, a small farm, and the eldest son got to stay on the farm, and the two younger brothers had to, to go find their own way, and, and both of those came to America. Uh, my dad's or grandfather settled in, in Nebraska. The other brother went on to California. But a couple years ago, I had uh, the good fortune to go back to Ireland, went back to the farm from which where they left in 1885, and to find out that we still have a cousin living on the farm that, that they left in 1885, and we thought that was pretty neat. But anyway, this is a scene from, from our ranching operation. It is in the southern end of the sand hills. Um, must have went the wrong way. There we go. And the, the sand hills encompass about uh, a third of Nebraska, or 25 percent of Nebraska, and it's the central part, northern central part of, the, of, of uh, Nebraska. We are blessed that we have the Birdwood Creek that does meander through our, our ranch. Um, the, excuse me, the, uh, the creek is one of the more steadily flowing streams in, in, in the country, uh, and it, it certainly provides uh, uh, water uh, to our cattle. And, and we too are, are you know, we, we try to do the right thing as, as far as fencing the, 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 the creek off from the livestock and putting in some alternative uh, livestock watering uh, locations on our, on our ranch. Uh, I am the third generation. My boys, our sons, are the fourth generation. And our, our ranch is divided up into, we have our, our cow-calf and then we have our stalker enterprise. And we have about a 20-some thousand acre ranch. It's both owned and leased. And because of the drought here this, this last year, uh, we've really had to reduce our stocking operation. In fact, as we're sorting st uh, steers this week to send to a commercial feed yard, just because we do not have uh, uh, the grass or the moisture to, to support those. Uh, this was in the North Platte Telegraph here just on, I believe, on May 1st. We did have the driest year on record, even beat the 30s. And I, I, in the fine print there, it says that we only had 7.23 inches uh, for the entire year. I think that was from March uh, 1st of April, a year ago to the 1st of April this year. Our average rainfall is about 18, uh, 18 to 19 inches in that area. Uh, that 66 in inches uh, that Antonio had would be to die for, I'll tell you. But anyway, uh, the, the, and in the 30s, you know, we talk about the drought in the 30s, and it, it was actually a little more moisture back in the 30s, and the wettest rainfall, the article said, was back in the 50s, which was about 38 inches. Uh, our family has deep roots, I think, in, in our stewardship, in that, you know, our goals is to provide a living to our family and to have a, a, a nice setting for our family. Uh, we want to be thoughtful stewards of wildlife, and that's very important to us. And we use wildlife on our ranch as an indicator species that if we see uh, uh, wildlife and they're doing well and they're increasing, then we're doing, uh, doing well as land managers. 
but we found out this last year we do need some help from Mother Nature to, to do a good job with that. And of course, I think our goal is, and I think most farmers and ranchers in Nebraska and probably the world want to leave that ranch or want to leave that land in better condition for the next generation. Um, these are some antelope on our ranch, and, and I talked a little about the sand hills. Uh, they are something special, 19,600 uh, square miles. Uh, it overlays the Ogallala Aquifer, which is one of the largest water aquifers in the, in the world. Um, the sand hills are 95% grassland. And for those of you that have been in the sand hills, I'm sure you've been amazed by the number of sand hill streams and the wetlands that, that you've seen there. It, it protects, if you will, a billion acres of groundwater. And what the sand hills do is they're a, just kind of like a giant sponge out there that soaks up any rainfall or or, or snow that we, we uh, accumulate up there. Plus at the same time that sand provides a, a great filter to screen it on down. Um, this is the, the Birdwood Creek that meanders through our ranch. And up and down that, that, that creek is, is seeps and springs that really are kind of controlled by barometric pressure. On days of high barometric pressure or low barometric pressure, you'll see some boiling springs along there and uh, it never dries up and hardly ever freezes in our country. And we'll get down into that. We, you know, at times we can get 20 below, but uh, most of the time that's, that streams are running. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about a conservation project that we had on our ranch. Uh, we had, oh, a few, a number of years ago, acquired an adjoining piece of property that had the Birdwood Creek that also meandered through it in part. And one of the previous landowners had straightened uh, approximately a mile or mile and a half of that stream to facilitate the haying uh, of the meadow there. And unfortunately, what that did after he straightened that creek was to speed up the flow of the water, which uh, water has a natural tendency to pick up some, some sand, and it just degraded the stream and lowered the water table six, eight, maybe even 10 feet in, in, in uh, areas. And I was certainly concerned about that. It, it basically dewatered that entire valley for that mile to two miles and talked to a number of uh, experts or conservation partners. And, and we came up with the idea, and the NRCS, in fact, found a, a, a map of an aerial photo back in the 1930s of which uh, showed the old meanders of the stream. And we overlaid that with a, a map of, of the new, uh, the Straighten Creek. And what we did with the help of a number of conservation partners was go back in and put some of the meanders back in and plug the, the, the ditch, basically. And the transformation there was just unbelievable. It brought that water table back up. Uh, it uh, brought us, uh, increased the grass production, hay production. It was a win-win for not only a, us as ranchers, but for wildlife and habitat also. Uh, this is one of the restored wetlands that, that, that uh, uh, got water back in it right alongside the creek. And these are just, you know, some of the environmental partners that worked with us to, to accomplish that task. It was over a $100,000 project. Um, the Sand Hills Task Force was one of those partners of which I'm a board member up in the Sand Hills. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife took their part, the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality. And the Nebraska Environmental Trust, we had a grant application through those or for some cost share dollars. The, the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy took a, a leadership role and helped coordinate the whole project with us. And uh, in return, we worked with them on a uh, conservation easement along the Crick Corridor, and they've been a great partners for us. The Nat NRCS, I mentioned them earlier, along with the Nat uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And I think that we as Nebraskans recognize the beauty of the Sand Hills, and we also recognize that we are stewards of that, that treasure. And we need to protect and preserve that, that area of the Sand Hills and the aesthetic values of the landscape. Uh, there's also some threats to that, the Nebraska Sand Hills that I just wanted to talk about briefly today. And, and one of them is the conversion of grassland to farmland. And of course, with seven and eight dollar corn, we have the, the encroachment of farm ground into the sand hills, and especially with the convenience of center pivot irrigation. There has been a conversion, and this is in the western corn belt, which takes into, into account the sand hills. There's been about 1.3 million acres converted over the last five years. 
And then again, we have urban sprawl that's creeping up from Interstate 80 into the Sand Hills. And a new threat, I think, fairly recently, I think that we need to talk about, even though it's, it's green energy, is wind energy. It is an environmental dilemma. And I know a lot of you are in support of, of wind energy, as, as I am also. But I think that we really need to take our time and place those large, massive wind farms in, in uh, strategically low impact, impact places. Uh, this is just this is a picture that we took in in Kansas on on a, on a ranch down there, and I, I you know I think that the picture speaks for itself. Wind energy concerns, in my mind, is the fragmentation, the loss of habitat, the, the visual effects, and what is the future impacts going to be on the central flyway. Uh, as you all know, we have a major flyway that passes through the Platte Valley and the central part of the Nebraska Sand Hills. Uh, that migration of literally hundreds and thousands of migratory birds and cranes, and, and more importantly, or, or as important as the grassland birds and the grouse. And I've had the opportunity to be in Kenya and see, in Kenya and Africa, and see the wildebeest uh, migration. And I think our crane migration, our grassland bird migration rivals that. And I think that those of us that live in Nebraska uh, we're accustomed to it and we, we take it for granted, but it's truly uh, a, a world-renowned uh, thing. So I think in summary, ranching and stewardship go together. The Nebraska Sandals are the largest intact prairie left in North America, and I, I, I firmly believe they need some protection. And I think there's an opportunity to exist. I know there is an opportunity to exist for ranchers to work with uh, various conservation partners and they're willing to do that. And I think that these massive wind farms should be located in environmentally less sensitive areas that are already disturbed and fragmented. In southwest Nebraska, there's literally thousands upon thousands of center pivots, and those pivot quarters, corners would be uh, areas that would certainly be already fragmented and it would be a good location for that. So with that, I'd say thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and um, I'm not reading the, the little descriptors uh, very accurately that are in your program, but if you look at Mike, you'll see that he's, he and his ranch have won uh, uh, several environmental and ranch management uh, awards, and uh, you definitely practice what you, what you uh, talk about today, so we, we are grateful for that. Our next speaker is Ken Schills, and Ken is uh, from a family operation out in the western part of the state. Um, they have uh, farming operations, but they also have a 20,000 head feedlot. Um, Ken also has served in the Nebraska legislature since 2008, and we welcome him now to speak to you. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, and good morning, and what a pleasure it is to be here to speak in front of all of you as I look around the room and I see so many faces that I know and I'm wondering what in the world am I doing up here speaking to all these folks that know so much more about this issue than I do. But they invited me, so here it goes. I, I do have to apologize. I, uh, I wasn't able to uh, come up with a, with a PowerPoint program I uh, spent yesterday in uh, Ogallala at an invasive species muscle conference that we held there uh, yesterday. So that was, that was a great day there and fits right into uh, what we're doing here today and what we're talking about. Uh, there are so many things that affect water and availability and, and the use and the quality and uh, all of those have to come together. I'll tell you a little bit about my, our, oper our family operation uh, near Ogallala. Um, my grandfather, I'm the third generation, my grandfather grew up in Cambridge, Nebraska. He was the oldest of 12 children. And uh, as Mr. Kelly said before, uh, in his family, the oldest got the opportunity to be there and to, and to be the one that got to stay on. Uh, in my family, when uh, you're the oldest of 12, that means you're old enough to go out and make a living while others are still at home living off mom and dad. So guess who got the boot there? Uh, my grandfather made it to Ogallala and Keith County by way of Oregon and California. He found out that he didn't really like to uh, dig potatoes and he wasn't a very good onion farmer. So he went out, and in 1939, he came to Ogallala, 
to work on Kingsley Dam. Well, unfortunately, they had enough help and didn't need anything, so he put his name in at the public works office, and a gentleman by the name of George McGinley said, hey, we could use a ranch hand. Well, it didn't take him very long to figure out that uh, my grandfather, Leo, wasn't a ranch hand. It only took getting bucked off the horse once and kicked in the head to figure out that maybe they should send him to the farm. So, uh, so we went to the farm, which is now uh, southeast of Brule, Nebraska, and uh, he started farming there. And he started uh, feeding cattle for the McGinley family. And uh, what's interesting about that is that in 1930s, George McGinley owned probably six of the nicest ranches in the state of Nebraska. He would raise his calves on those ranches, then bring them to the feed yard at Brule, retain ownership in them, feed them out, and then take them to St. Joe, uh, Denver, or Omaha to the stockyards to be sold. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Over time, we got away from that. We got into uh, buying cattle from everywhere, feeding cattle for everybody. And I should say, uh, I'm in a little different position than, than these folks are. Uh, they get to raise the cattle. Once they get to the feed yard, it's very intense. Uh, we, we feed the cattle, we feed them to get them fat, we feed them in as short a time as possible so that they can go to market in the most efficient and valuable manner possible. So when he says that when they hit 1,200 pounds, that's the ending point, well, he's done a lot of research and others have done a lot of research to know that that's the case. Here in Nebraska, we don't, we don't do many grass-fed cattle. We, we feed most of our cattle corn, fed rations, and you know we talked about some of the things that have changed over time. Well, it used to be that if you, uh, if you fed cattle, you wanted to feed them corn, obviously. Well, then we got the idea that, hey, if you, can, if you can crack that corn, you can get much more utilization out of that corn for the animal. And then we got really smart and we figured out that if you could make it into cereal and you could uh, flake that corn, that it made even more advantage to the cattle, made it even more efficient for those animals to gain. And then, what we found out is that through this expansion of ethanol and everything like that, what we found out with the byproduct, which in our world, a lot of folks will say the byproduct is the ethanol, but uh, the corn byproduct that you get, the corn gluten that comes out of that is one of the most amazing cattle feed I've ever seen. It's incredible. And what we found out was you no longer have to flake your corn. In fact, if you mix the, uh, the distiller's grain, right? With cracked corn, it's actually more efficient than flaked corn. So everybody that spent millions of dollars getting their flakers in place are now figuring out how the heck to get out from under them because they cost a lot of money and maintenance to run electricity, boilers, all that kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff that you have to deal with. So as we've come through time, we've had to become more efficient in feeding the animals because that's what the, that's what the consumer demands. Not only have we become more efficient, but we've also had to, be, have had to become better at producing the type of meat and the quality of meat that people are willing to pay for. Because as we heard earlier, it's hard to make it on just a commodity price. You have to have some way to differentiate yourself from everybody else that's doing it and get more money in your pocket to be successful over time. That's where... Uh, that's where the uh, real advantage of going to a feed yard comes from. And I can guess if we talk to any of these folks that are up here, all, all three folks here are cow-calf folks. They have all the data on every animal that they produce. And if they're doing it uh, the way I think they probably are, when those cattle go into the, if, if they're owning some of those cattle and they have an agreement with, with the packer as they go through, they're getting data back on each one of those cattle so that they can go forward and make those decisions. We worked very closely uh, while I was managing the feed yard. I don't do that anymore. They've, uh, my family has found something uh, less uh, detrimental to them for me to do, and that's here in the Nebraska legislature. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we, we work very closely, and we're a, uh, we're a premier partner with uh, certified Angus beef. So when you heard Antonio talk about uh, the Angus breed and all that, uh, we are very happy to become partners with them, and we've worked with them for a number of years. Uh, while we were there, and while we were working with them, 
uh, seeing that our feed yard sits right on the south side of Interstate 80, and everybody might wonder, now why would you put a feed lot there? Well, I can tell you this. The feed yard was there before the interstate came through. When the interstate came through, they offered us some money to move it just a little bit south. And let me tell you, it was worth enough to move that far south. So as we did that, and we, uh, we, learned, how, we learned how best to do this, and we partnered up with Certified Angus Beef, and through that time, uh, we created programs to where we went out to Angus breeders, to people that raised commercial Angus cattle, and we built a consortium of about 10,000 head of cattle that at any time we could bring to the feed yard, we could call upon them, and they brought them to the feed yard. Um, during that time, we also worked on some electronic identification stuff that would have allowed, would have allowed the producer and anybody else within the chain of, of, uh, of the supply chain there to be able to add information to a uh, RFID tag and be able to read information off of that tag at any time during the animal's life. And we worked with a company that just drove by the feed yard because it sits right on the south side of the interstate and stopped in and said, hey, and he was shaking this little tag in front of him. He said, would your industry be interested in a tag that you could write information on and read it back off at any time during the animal's life? Well, not being any smarter than I am, I shut the door and I said, absolutely. And we started talking about it and developed that. And in 2003, because of the work that was done there and the consortium we'd built of uh, growers throughout uh, the upper Midwest and Montana and South Dakota and North Dakota, uh, in 2003, we were named uh, the premier partner uh, award for the certified Angus beef. And that just happened to be at their 25th anniversary. So uh, I got to meet all the people that were told by everybody else that this crazy idea you have to measure carcass and this crazy idea you have to market Angus bulls will never work. And 25 years later, certified Angus beef is the biggest brand in the world when it comes to beef. And so those are the types of things that have changed over time. And as Antonio said, if you're, if you're not within a program, you're, you're getting commodity prices. Now, what does that really mean as we move forward and how does it affect what we're talking about here today? I think, uh, I think one thing that we've learned, and I haven't even talked about the farm yet, one thing that we've learned is that over time, we see that uh, the number of head of cattle is decreasing because we're just making them bigger. When you saw a 1,500 pound carcass weight, when my grandfather sold cattle, they were all mostly Herefords, because that's about all there were around. When he took them to Omaha, they averaged 900 pounds. Today, they average 1,400 to 1,500 pounds. So we're putting that much more in every animal and reducing the number of animals out there. So as I look at that, when you talk about efficiencies, that's real. Just one thing on the farm, we'll touch on that just a little bit. We have a 5,000 acre farm. We farm corn, soybeans, alfalfa, wheat. We, uh, we have both groundwater and surface water. We hold a uh, 1923 uh, natural flow right on the South Platte River. And it just so happens that we are the first diversion inside the state of Nebraska from Colorado. So basically, when we make, it, when we make a call on the river, Colorado producers get shut down, not Nebraska producers. So we're that first diversion in there. And the things that we've been doing to help, uh, to help improve what we've got there, since we have wells that sit on every piece of our property, we are actively working with our local NRD, Natural Resource District, to look into what it would mean to turn that project into a recharge project and to be able to store the water underground. Because as we've heard, if we're going to have more times of volatile weather, when we get more rain one time and then it's dry for a longer period of time, we need to find these types of solutions to be able to capture that water when it is available and store that water to where we can make the best use out of it. And in my mind, if you can store it underground and just save the six to eight percent that would be lost in evaporation, uh, if you can do that, I know people that if they could make eight, six to eight percent every single year, year after year after year, that'll keep you afloat and that'll keep you working. So it's those types of things that we're working on out there to help improve things. And, and just one more thing. It used to be that you farmed fence row to fence row. And it's some of the little things that we've been able to figure out, like putting corners into habitat for wildlife and things like that. It's those simple little things where you take that less less, uh, more marginal ground and turn them into those types of operations and do those kinds of things.
Last year, we saw more pheasants and more wildlife on our land than we've seen in probably 30 years. And we haven't done anything except for just change some things that we do on our corners. So solutions are out there. Uh, as, I told, uh, as I told somebody here earlier, we're all in this together. We have to make it work together. And I know that with conferences like this and, uh, and, and you folks working, we all can make it work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. I uh, really appreciate your service in the legislature. Um, I think maybe your, your ranch is actually miss, missing out on some good ideas. Uh, our final uh, producer is Duke Phillips. Uh, Duke uh, operates two diversified ranches, and, and, and when he says diversified, they are diversified. Very interesting. Um, different set of enterprises that he has on these. Uh, Duke uh, started out his ranching career in Mexico and then has uh, come up to uh, Colorado and Texas. And uh, with that, Duke. Thank you. Um, I've never spoken to a group of people this big before. Um, so it's a real honor for me to be even invited. Um, I was raised in a, in a really, uh, not only a different country, but in a, a, a different kind of world. Uh, it was very isolated. We are about five hours from town. And uh, as a consequence, the people that I, was, that I grew up with were very connected to the land because they had to survive from what they produced. And so um, it was a real blessing for me to have that background. Um, and I never dreamed that I'd be living in an environment where I'd be within two hours of over a million people, which I am today. Um, at first, I looked at that as a, as a threat. And uh, over time, my perspective on ranching and people has changed greatly because I've come to see ranchers as being uh, one of the best alternatives for resolving some of the ecological issues that we face today that are so monumental, because we live on the land, we have a lot to stake. <clears throat> I also um, feel that ranchers are at a crossroads. Um, I, you know, I think that if we don't do something different, being 2% of the population fading very fast, that we're one day going to not be, not be here. Um, another thing that I realized is that there's a huge gap between people who live in town and people who live in the country. We have education programs on our ranch. We have 2,000 kids who come K through 12, and we have a lot of adults. And it's not, I'm not exaggerating when I say that these kids really think that cowboys are people who are running around shooting guns in the air on horseback like they see in the movies. And so... Um, <coughs> As I have come closer in contact with our society and being a professional rancher, um, my goal has changed from um, trying to create my own world out away from everyone, my own kingdom, where I came from, to trying to create uh, an opportunity for people to get together and learn from each other. Uh, people like us who live in the country and people in town who uh, are very concerned but really don't have the experience or the, uh, uh, the, the kinds of things in their lives that would bring them in touch with nature. <clears throat> so those are some of the things that, that, um, that, I, that I believe in. And the, perhaps they will tell you a little bit about, uh, um, explain why I have created the organization that I have. Um, the website, I guess it's not going not to go up, but we were going to try to get the website with pictures up for you to see. <clears throat> so these are just pictures. We have three different websites. Uh, Ranchlands is a company that I manage. I, don't, I do not own any land uh, except for about a half an acre. We just bought a house, my wife and I, in town. But I manage about 200,000 acres. Uh, one ranch belongs to the Nature Conservancy, and the other ranch belongs to the Colorado State Land Board. 
Um, the Chico Basin Ranch is a property located southeast of Colorado Springs. It's 85,000 acres owned by the state land board. I have a 25-year lease. It's, I feel like I'm living my dream. Um, I worked many years uh, across the United States from Florida, New Mexico, um, Nevada, Oregon, Australia, Latin America, uh, working just because I wanted to go out and learn as much as I could. And I studied under um, people like Alan Savory, Bud Williams, Ray Hunt, uh, Tom Lasseter, my heroes. My dad said, don't go study agriculture. Uh, go work for people who are doing what you think you would like to do. And so finally, I ended up on my own place, which is the Chico Basin Ranch. It's a beautiful prairie landscape located southeast of Colorado Springs. Uh, that's it right there. Um, with raising my family, I have a wife and four children, and two of the oldest ones have returned back, and they're working in the family business. Cattle is our main, um, it's our core business activity. We have a purebred beef master seed stock business. Uh, we produce all our own bulls. Uh, we have a commercial cow business producing calves, commercial calves. We have a grass-fed meat business that we sell uh, grass-fed meat to Whole Foods through the Internet and other kinds of um, natural food businesses. Um, we have a, uh, a yearling operation, and we also buy and sell cattle. So if we see an opportunity somewhere to buy some cows and develop them or some heifers or something, we'll develop them and then resell them. So we're very diversified just in the cattle business. Um, we also look at land as a multidimensional resource, not just a home for cattle. Uh, I think conservation and economics uh, are or linked together, and, they, and conservation has to pay for itself in the long run, <clears throat> or it's not going to happen. Um, ranchers have taken a rap over time because of, the, of abuse of land, but many, if not most of the times, it's because of economic reasons. You're, you're up against the wall with a drought or with a, a downturn in the economy or something. So if you have another business uh, to compensate for those down times when well, you can reduce stocking rates and cooperate better with your, your, your resources, your natural resources. So we have a, a wide cross-section of businesses. We have a hospitality business. It's not a dude ranch. At first, I was scared to death of bringing people to the ranch because I didn't want to entertain them all the time. But <clears throat> so we make it really clear, if you come here, you're going to go to work. We show up at 7 and go out with us. But... Um, travel industry has changed greatly. Um, experiential based uh, vacations are very popular, and we have a, a growing family of people who come to the ranch to uh, learn about ranching and to become involved. And they judge the, the quality of their experience on the ranch by how, um, to what degree they contribute, contribute to what we're doing. Um, we have uh, a art um, exhibit. We invite artists and photographers to come to the ranch and they spend uh, two, three days. Some artists come and ride with us and we have an exhibit. We have uh, music concerts. We have a hunting fishing enterprises. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier we have a, a very large education program. We have about 2,000 kids that come through our program. Colorado Springs is 45 minutes away in Pueblo. Uh, as well. So we have about 400,000 people right there. So a lot of kids, a lot of people want to get out and see nature. So it's all free. Uh, we pay for all of it. Um, we also manage a ranch for the Nature Conservancy, and we have uh, a herd of bison that runs on 50,000 acres as a conservation herd. Uh, a conservation herd basically means we're trying to recreate uh, a herd of wild bison, try to emulate what they once were as much as possible with limited space. Um, and so that's been a, a learning experience, um, herding wild bison. Um, my respect for the animals is, is, is uh, changed the way I look at animals. It's really, really amazing. We also have a uh, guest business there that is larger. On the Chico, which is the first ranch I was talking about, it's two bedrooms. 
on this ranch, it's uh, 15 bedrooms. My daughter runs it. And we see guests from all over the world. And this, this ranch is because of the nature of conservancy. Um, we offer a broader range of activities, which could be we have a naturalist on board. And so we take interpretive walks. Uh, bison are a big uh, po or popular theme. Um, the Sand Dunes National Park is right next door. Um, Michael Forsberg brings uh, his family down, and we have photography workshops as well. So it's also trying to just get people to come to the ranch, uh, either through art, through music, through education, through producing healthy food, and trying to build a consensus or a group of people who want to um, support something that um, they believe in, that is, that is doing something positive for the land and for the food, uh, uh, creating a healthy food. Um, I could talk a lot more. Um, one more thing. I always forget to talk about conservation because I do it every day, but it, it's a product just like hospitality or hunting or fishing. To me, um, conservation has always been something that we do as ranchers, but in today's world, I think it is a product. Uh, the cattle we use as a tool to manipulate the surface of the ground to achieve our conservation values, filtering, trapping the water, um, filtering the water, um, making the water cycle much more efficient. Um, so um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to ask any questions. We have, a, as you've heard, a great panel and of people that are approaching uh, their ranching and, and cattle feeding operations in a very intellectual way, thinking much beyond just their short-term profits. And so at this time, normally I would, take a f I would ask them a few questions, but, but they had such interesting stories, I didn't uh, impose a time limit. So I'd like to open it up at this time to the audience to ask questions. So, uh, anyone has a question of any of the panelists? Uh, you know, we have those two mics back there. Well, I, while you decide, I will, uh, I'll ask a question to, to anyone on the panel that wants to uh, answer it, and that is, um, you know, yesterday we, we heard about the uh, climate change and some of the indicators uh, climate change is occurring. Uh, earlier this morning, Chuck Hibbard, Extension Dean here, talked about planting dates moving up uh, as much as three weeks in this, uh, in Nebraska and different parts. I'm wondering if you have noticed climate change and how that's impacted your operation and anything that you might be doing uh, in thinking about what the future might bring relative to that? Well, uh, to Duke. I, don't know, I don't know if drought is... Um, Duke, Duke is... Speak. I don't know if you can hear me. They have to know who's talking so they can turn on the right mic. <laughs> uh, we're dealing with a very severe, is that better? We're, we're dealing with a very severe drought as, as you are here, and I'm not sure if, if that is a consequence of, of the uh, change in climate. But um, we, it's, it didn't rain in 2002, and then uh, for the last three years it has not rained in our part of the country and we're destocking by 80% as of today. Um, so it's very severe and a huge problem. I, I, this is Ken here. Ken. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, when we talk about climate change and we talk about uh, those, those kinds of situations, when you're, when you're there on the ground, it doesn't really matter. The question is, is did you get enough moisture or didn't you? Is it too warm, is it too cold? You have to deal with that no matter what it is. And so, and so that broader question, I guess, should be left to other folks. Uh, we just have to learn and find ways to deal with it. And, and you know, when we, last year, when we were to this point in time, we'd probably had about, what, 10, 15 days over 80 degrees? 
And now we haven't had, you know, we haven't had days over 80 degrees this whole spring. So uh, one thing about Nebraska, it tends to even things out over time. Just wait long enough. Well, let's go to the mics. I'd like to ask Antonio if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, social and political forces that are at work that created those uh, new legislations, new, new rules about water use in your country. They seem very different than the way things have gone here, but maybe they're a precursor to what might be happening. Uh, yes. Um, like I said, I think they're the very restricted in terms of uh, natural resources utilization after this bill was passed. Just one thing that I would like to, to point out, and I'll, I'll try to explain that. Uh, this was, uh, when they first drew it, uh, it, didn't, it didn't was actually uh, written as it was passed. So we had to uh, changes that I believe were more uh, suitable. And so did the House of Deputies thought, and so did our Senate thought. But when it came to President Dilma's desk, she just overruled it. Am I just getting this too personal, but do I think there was a <laughs> lot, a lot press pressure on her decision in voting in political? Yes, I, I, I don't know if that answers the, the question, but uh, so this changed a lot uh, our operation. Huh? This, this decision changed our life, and uh, how are we managing uh, our ranches based on this, this decision? And, uh, is that it? I know some, yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Kelly Witkowski with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. Thank you for your presentations. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on um, if your implementation of good practices has inspired your neighbors or people around you to do the same, um, and if not, what you think the obstacles are and how they might be overcome. Are you directing that to the panel as a whole? OK. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, I'm a member of this association. And uh, when I first moved to the, the countryside, I was eager for as much information that I could receive. And I see those guys being the, the high quality producers. How do I get my ranch to be more productive? So uh, I had my ears open, and I was uh, joining with them. And I think I'm doing my homework to sharing uh, about the association with every neighbor that I can. If every time I go to the beef industry to follow up with my selling, I'm telling, hey, did, did you sell your cattle through the association? And if not, this is what you're missing. And this is how you're, you're supposed to, to be there, uh, how, how to get there. So I think it's more a mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, issue. And, uh, have to go over a few boundaries, but uh, there's no, no way around. Huh? You, you have to, I think. Well, in Nebraska, give me on. In Nebraska, we're blessed with the, with the university, and, and I think it was mentioned earlier today, the, the research center up at, at Gudmundson, which is a ranch that was donated to the university that's used for, for research. They have uh, annual field days that are, are well attended, well accepted by the, the ranching folks, and we go there for new ideas, and, and uh, they work very closely, I, th I think, with the ranchers. I, I guess I've been a, a guinea pig, and the fact is, I think today, we have a university project on our ranch, uh, AI and a bunch of heifers, that's in cooperation with Dr. Funkston from uh, the North Platte Research Center, and so, uh, you know, we have been offered our opportunities, and we have worked very closely with them. And I, and, uh, uh, I guess from the ranchers, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for all of you folks that are involved with the university and providing that to us as, as farmers and ranchers in Nebraska. I think as you, look at, uh, as you look at that and you wonder as to whether or not whether people are, are taking on new practices, finding ways to do things more efficiently, I think the inevitable answer is yes. Uh, because if they don't, they aren't going to be around. And this doesn't just, I mean, it's not just the dollars and cents. It's everything. It's like everybody said on this panel, uh, and I think Duke said it best, uh, you know, this all has to come together, right? 
Your, your cattle don't do any good if there's no grass to eat. Your cattle don't do any good if the water's, you know, not available and not there. And then Mike said the same thing on some of those unintended consequences of what happens. Uh, you, you know, when you straighten out a stream and you don't realize the, uh, the recharge implications of that, it, it's huge. But I, I think that as you look around, those early adopters do have an effect. And uh, you, if, you, if you don't think the coffee shops are going on about that when people are sitting there drinking their coffee about what the neighbors are doing, then uh, uh, you need to attend some more of those because that's all about it. Uh, in my case, uh, my neighbors would be the last people who do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think any change has to be uh, economically, uh, there has to be a strong economic incentive which is obvious, but I, I also think that uh, any change has to be, any, any significant, of any proportion has to be a grassroots movement. Jesse, Jesse Sturita with the Water for Food Institute. First of all, thank you all so much for uh, performing so many different roles beyond what we would commonly think a farmer and rancher uh, to perform. The, Antonio's been a popular guy this morning, so I think I'll ask him this question, but if others would like to chime in, uh, feel free. I'm kind of curious to know about uh, how the uh, youth in Brazil are stimulated to uh, participate in agriculture, being that that's a big undercurrent in Nebraska with organizations like Future Farmers of America. How do you, uh, being a young guy yourself, how do you get uh, those kinds of people motivated to ranch? Well, thank you, Jesse. Uh, I think that the presentation that was uh, held uh, before ours uh, just blew my mind. Uh, the, the job that has been done to try to give training to the youth, we have nothing similar in, in Brazil. Uh, why am I at the ranch? I think I'm over there just because my, my dad had it. I, we don't see any young youngsters uh, migrating from the, the city to the urban area. That's just not happening in Brazil. Uh, as I move from the city to the rural area, I think I can say this uh, with no doubt, uh, the, the countryside of Brazil lacks so many infrastructure and so many availabilities on, on things that it's, it, it, it takes quite a uh, courage to say, I'm going to give all this up and go over there. So I was sharing with them, for instance, in one of our ranches, the, my employees live over there. Uh, I provide them with uh, f food, uh, clothing, electricity, water. This is all under my expenses. And, um, but the, the city does send a bus to pick the, the kids to, to go to school. It's a two and a half hour drive on the bus, on the dirt road, that is as, as bumpy as it can get in an old bus. No air conditioning, pure dust. Two hours, two hours and a half to go, another two hours and a half to get back. So when I was faced with that, it just shocked me. And I, I could give so many examples of that. So uh, if you're a young guy, you live in the city and you have so many opportunities to make a living and to raise a family and everything. I cannot blame why they're not moving to the countryside of Brazil. So the majority of the youngsters that are still running the show is just because their fathers or grandfathers were doing so. Okay, next Thank question. You. Uh, I've been in Nebraska, oh, my name's Dale McDermott. I'm uh, with Lycor Biosciences here in Lincoln. Uh, and I've been a Nebraska resident now for more than 25 years and, and uh, I really appreciate uh, what uh, the panelists said about Western Nebraska. It's truly a, a wonderful natural resource. So uh, my question's for Michael Kelly. Um, in regard to what you said about wind farm placement, uh, are you yourself or other ranchers uh, gaining traction in uh, helping determine where those wind farms are placed? You know, frankly, I think that we need some help. Um, there's been, and, and, and the senator can certainly tell us about all of the uh, tax incentives that have been, uh, went through the legislature this year to encourage uh, these large energy companies to come into Nebraska 
and rightfully so for economic development. And I'm the first to say that a lot of our rural towns in, in the Sand Hills and in western Nebraska, they need help. But we need a balance. And I, I, what I'm really sincerely scared of is this shotgun approach uh, where we have uh, perhaps a group of landowners that, that uh, are encouraged that they may be able to make some extra money by allowing a wind energy, that invites a wind energy com company come in. But I think that we as Nebraskans need to take uh, a, a stewardship role and say, okay, there's, there's areas in Nebraska that it should be all right for wind energy and encourage the placement of that. But in Kansas, for an example, and wind energy came into Kansas uh, a number of years ago, but when it approached the, the Flint Hills, and Flint Hills is a special area of, the, of Kansas, like the Sand Hills are in Nebraska, the governor uh, took a conservation role and said, okay, we'll, we can have wind energy in the, in the Flint Hills, but, let's, but there's special areas that we need to protect. And he appointed a special task force to, to uh, analyze, and it was made up of not only ranchers, but scientists and, and folks from the university to identify areas where it's appropriate to place wind energy and areas where it's not appropriate. I have not heard this conversation in Nebraska. And I think that we all owe it to our ancestors and future generations to have that conversation. And the sooner we start that conversation, the better it is for the next generation. Okay, we have two gentlemen left standing. I think those will be the last questions. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, my name is Gus Von Rowan. I am a permaculture consultant with Nebraska Farmers Union. And uh, I enjoyed the presentation. And uh, I have a question for Mr. Phillips. You mentioned Alan Savory. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to see his TED Talk and the implications of what pasture mob grazing or mob grazing with pasture or adjacent uh, dryland farmers can do. I was wondering if you could address any of these topics, please. Uh, could, you, could you repeat what you would like for me to address? The, uh, what Alan Savory's mob grazing techniques, oh. uh, and if you can uh, address uh, partnering up with other dryland farmers, uh, at least the ranchers with other dryland farmers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, mob farming is, or mob grazing is uh, a technique which consolidates all the cattle that might be run in several pastures into one pasture and then move that in a migratory fashion uh, and not return to where they had grazed until uh, those plants are completely recovered and you're disturbing the land at the same time as you're grazing and you're recycling nutrients, you're, doing, you're laying mulch down grass that you don't eat. So they're trying to duplicate what happened once with bison. And so um, that is what I have learned from him and I, in terms of doing it with your neighbor or with other people, uh, your biggest constraint is always water. It's also your, your, your most costly part of the whole thing. That's your bottleneck. Electric, a single strand of, a, of, a, of electric wire is very cheap and fast, and we use it all the time. So I think there's a, the practical realities of how do you water enough cattle. And Alan Savory thinks huge. And so um, unless you have a river or lakes, things like that. Um, but the idea, I think, is fantastic if it can be done. Uh, my name is Irv McQuarrie. I write a finance blog focused on agriculture. Question for Mr. Phillips. Uh, you talked about how ranching is such a small percentage of activity in this country and how it might be disappearing. That seems a little hard to fit in with the uh, doubling of food production that will be necessary by 2050, but that also entails a tripling of protein consumption. We all know that. and. Angus beef cattle is a pretty good source of protein. It may not be as efficient as aquaculture, but it's certainly a favorite item on people's plates if they can afford it. So how do you reconcile that with farming being on the brink of disappearing? I mean, ranching cattle being on the brink of disappearing. I'm not really sure I understand your question. Uh, we need a lot of protein. And as people enter the middle class in Asia and Africa and so forth, they're, they're going to want beef protein. And 
you know, do we want to bow out of supplying that because of con constraints in this country? I mean, your, your concern is that ranching is disappearing. And how do you reconcile that with the need for protein? Well, uh, there, there's a lot of... Um there's a lot of land that cannot be used for any other purposes, first of all. Um, and it's also, I think, an important cultural aspect of our society. Um, and I believe that cattle grazing or grazing animals is a, an important part of regeneration of ecosystem and trying to enhance it and protect it and enhance the, the different ecosystem processes. So, so it's, about, it's about drought. Is that your concern? You're culling 80% of your herd? That you're fearing there's going to be more of that in the future? You mean from a drought standpoint? Yes, that's why you're culling your herd, right? Correct. So yes, we'll destock to the extent we have to to protect the land. Thank you. All right, one last question. We still have a little time, so this will be the last. My name is Roberto. I'm a PhD student here in UNL. Um, first, thank you for, for the, the presentation. So I have, as a student, I have the opportunity to go to know the whole Nebraska, including the Sand Hill. So every of your presentation brings to my, to my head many, many machines, and I, I could perceive how the the rancher and farmer who was so friendly with me uh, during my sampling time. So um, we have listened many things about energy, about water, about food, about poor people. Uh, many, many of these ideas came to us. So my question is mainly for the, the two person, people from, from Nebraska. I would like your opinion about the the Keystone oil uh, pipeline, and even when your opinion is yes, no, I would like uh, to know why. And maybe some of you can explain to, to the audience what is the, the Keystone oil pipeline. Well, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the Keystone XL pipeline has been an issue for a number of years. Um, We've had to deal with it in the legislature for a number of years as well. I keep, I keep thinking at some point uh, the, the fervor will die down, but uh, it, it's everywhere. Um, I, I look at it this way. The, the state of Nebraska right now, as we speak, has about 20,000 miles of pipeline buried below the surface. Now, most of that pipeline, I mean almost none of that pipeline runs through the sand hills. Uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of negotiations that went on, a lot of uh, a lot of work that went to find the safest route within Nebraska, and we're still working on that to find out whether we found that or not. And we're waiting we're waiting to hear back from the federal government. I have uh, I have steadfastly been in support of of that pipeline as well as other pipelines because just as we talked about and we heard speakers talk about earlier. Um, Without a form of energy to do what we do every day, uh, it makes it pretty darn tough to get our agricultural products, our food, to the places where it's needed. And as I look at it, it you know, we are in a we are in a carbon fuel world, and I don't see that changing here. Really, in the next 50, 100 years, without a huge impetus to do so, and I think that only comes from running out of a particular, uh, whether it's oil or gas or whatever, because that really is probably the only and biggest incentive to move us away from carbon-based fuel. Now, is it right? Is it wrong? Well, I guess uh, time will tell, but, uh, but that's been my position, and we, we will have to wait to see what uh, President Obama uh, and the State Department decide on the issue, but, uh, but as I've looked at it and studied it through, through my involvement within the legislature, I would, uh, I would be in support of the route that it's on now. Thank you. I, uh, I asked 
Ken to, to uh, that he would be welcome to be a little controversial if he would like in, during the conference. And <laughs> he saved it to the very <laughs> end, so I appreciate that. Um, a, few, a number of years ago, uh, probably about 10 or so, um, when I was pretty much just uh, a producer, didn't work at the university, and I would go to, to different meetings, the farm managers kept talking about the fact, they kept reminding the attendees that farming was a business. It was not a lifestyle, and I'd go to another meeting. Farming is a business, it's not a lifestyle. But one day out on the tractor after hearing this a number of times, I thought, no, it's both. It's a business and a lifestyle, and the lifestyle goes beyond. You have to enjoy what you're doing. I hope everybody is involved in, an, in a, a line of work that's also a lifestyle that they like, because everybody's job is a lifestyle. But I think we have a panelist here today who are making decisions, good decisions based on a business model, but they're also making a good, uh, good decisions based on a lifestyle model. They're creating uh, enterprises that do more than just return a profit to their business. So help me in thanking them for their presentation.